making a date once again. We are going to begin with energy issues because the Africa Center for Energy Policy, ASEP, has criticized government over the suspension of new sulfur levels for fuel. Energy Minister Boache Jaku says the move is mainly due to the high cost involved in the implementation of this directive. But the Africa Center for Energy Policy, ASEP, warns of huge economic and health implications. Here's more in this report. Several experts in the petroleum sector have spelled doom for Ghana's energy sector following government's resolve to suspend the policy that requires petroleum products with low sulfur level of 50 ppm and below to be imported into the country. Benjamin Boache is the Director of Operations for the Africa Center for Energy Policy, ASAP. He tells Joy Business that a resolve by the sector minister is bound to have a ripple effect on the economic outlook of Ghana's energy sector. We have to reverse that decision to suspend it and get uh, 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 the new policy uh, uh, implemented as soon as possible. We are talking about its impact even on cars. A lot of cars today that are coming in Ghana brand new are not configured. Uh, for some of these dirty products, you know. So once you put them in, you are risking the engines. Uh, they will break down. We have to import. We are sending more dollars to go and buy products that we don't uh, manufacture locally. You know, so its implication no, is not just on our health, but also on the economy. Too. Chief Executive of the Chamber of Bulk Oil Distribution Companies, Senor Jose, agrees with ASAP. He fears this new directive is bound to affect the credibility of Ghana's energy sector. As we speak, vessels are on their way with a new specification. And that will be quite confusing for the market, exactly what do we really want to do. But you should also remember I also have an advisory role as far as the ministry is concerned. So I may have to confer with the minister and get to understand a bit more of the details. But if you want to answer, so hasn't the MPA uh, communicated such decision to you, the players, on this action. What I understand was a cabinet decision. The minister spoke to us on it on record, and we've had that on air as well, and that has not been communicated to you. Well, this industry is a very well-regulated industry, and it's governed by an act, and there are clear directives and processes. And we are unaware. So um, if this is what they wish to do, would have to be advised properly. And any consequences resulting from that, because there may be economic losses for people who have already started buying and then uh, trading, uh, importing the current products. I mean, what happens? A number of things that will have to be looked at, but I don't really understand the motivation or the motive for it. It's more appropriate to go the old one. I mean, I'm, at, I'm at quite at a loss. Be, but be the, I mean, some of your members have already committed some investment into this as well, and uh, this would, what could be the impact on their operation? The people have already ordered products, and this, this runs into millions of dollars. What the variances would be, I mean, I don't know. There would definitely be some loss to it. It's communication that the uh, further industry consultations, it looks like some uh, protests have come up to us and that is why uh, they were forced to uh, still review the whole process, the economic cost as well in implementing this to, to the country. Uh, but possibly that may be new, maybe I'm not aware. Because as far as I know, I know that consultation has been widespread. We had um, challenges with um, an implementation plan where the MP had set up a committee with all stakeholders in, and we worked out the implementation plan. There's supposed to be a monitoring committee. In a related development, the National Petroleum Authority appears not to be aware of this suspension. Checks with senior officials at the authority indicate that they are yet to receive any communication on this suspension. Joy Business is learning that the National Petroleum Authority is going ahead with the program unless it receives an official communication from government on the suspension. Well, uh, still on the subject, we want to bring you exactly uh, what the energy minister said, his explanation for the suspension of the implementation of the new soft levels. We are currently at 3,000 ppms. We've come down significantly. But remember that most of our refined products are imported. Currently in Europe, it will be difficult to find a refinery that is doing 3,000 ppm. Most of them are around 10 ppm. So if you want to import from Europe sooner than later, they are going to have to do a special blend for you. 
And a special blend will be more expensive than a general blend. Because they are doing a special blend for you, it will cost you a little more. Or, as it happens now, they bring the 10 ppm from Europe into a, a place like Togo, and then re-blend it from 10 to 3,000 and sell to us. They are making a hefty profit at our expense. Additionally, as technology moves, as the engines of vehicles and other manufacturing uh, plants also improve, you are going to require low sulfur uh, uh, fuels. Otherwise, it begins to damage the engines, it begins to have impact on the environment, it begins to have an impact on our health. And if you do the social cost-benefit analysis, you'd realize that the externalities of these costs clearly overwhelm any benefits or savings in terms of the pricing. Our calculation is that if we made it even across board, it could only uprice by about one, one and a half percent. But who is calculating the, the cost of externalities, environment, health, and all of that? So we want to look at it over, all over again, engage people to understand why there is a need to do this, get their fuller buy-in before we move on. Well, uh, in another development, Energy Minister Boati Jako uh, has been engaging Jubilee partners to significantly reduce the shutdown time for repair works on the FPSO. Lead partner Talo Oil has indicated that it would shut down production on the field for about 12 weeks to carry out corrective works on the vessel used in collecting, producing and storing crude on the Jubilee field. There are fears that the action could result in some serious power crisis in the country. The corrective works which will be carried out on the Jubilee FPSO would last for about 12 weeks. This is to enable lead operator on the Jubilee field, Talo Oil, carry out some corrective works on the Tarrant Bearing. The part of the Jubilee FPSO that is used in collecting crude oil from the seabed onto the Jubilee field. Some of the country's major energy plants depend on gas from the Jubilee field for power generation. Therefore, there are fears that this move may affect power supply and possibly result in power crisis during the last quarter of this year. But the Energy Minister, Boachi Ejaku, says there's no cause for alarm. The Jubilee field gas that comes through the FPSO Kwame Nkrumah into a power generation situation can now be exported from Jubilee field and stored in the reservoirs of 10 so that it can be called up they just have to do the gas accounting. But because 10 is not coming through FPS or Kwame Nkrumah, it's, it's not affected. The availability of the exported gas is no longer subject to the unavailability of FPS or Kwame Nkrumah. So once it's exported now and stored in the reservoirs of 10, it becomes available for power generation. On the whole, if FPS requirement chroma goes down for remediation works. A total of about 500 megawatts of power becomes unavailable because there's, there isn't gas. Tapco and Ameri. Tico will run on, on, on LCO, light crude oil. However, we have sufficient capacity in the system to cover the, the, the loss of 500 megawatts. First is the fact that we can ramp up AXA. We can also ramp up uh, uh, Sonsona Sogli. And then car power ship 225, which is being pulled out of service, is being replaced by car power ship 450. That immediately provides us 225 megawatts additional capacity that was not in the system.
So between the ramping up of AXA, ASOGLI, and the addition of car powership to the excess of 225 from car powership, we cover up that deficit that could be experienced from the shutdown of FPS Okwam in Kroma. It is estimated that the country loses about a million dollars any time the field shuts down for some corrective works. This has influenced the minister to move to engage the partners to cut down the proposed 12 weeks to carry out the repair works. According to government, it has also instituted some measures like importing gas and even looking at the option to import some power from neighboring countries to make up for the shortfall in gas supply from the Jubilee field. While still on energy issues, the use of expensive thermal plants to generate power could likely see utility tariffs reviewed upwards in the coming weeks. This is according to the executive director of the Kumasi Institute of Technology and Environment, Ishmael Ejekumhene, who has been speaking to Joy Business on how best government can reduce utility tariffs drastically. Most, if not all, of Ghana's energy plants are powered with light crude. This development has seen tariffs in the country relatively high considering the high cost of energy production. Executive Director with Kite Energy, Ishmael Ejikumhene, tells Joy Business the trend of high tariffs can be reverted should the number of these expensive plants be reduced. Majority of the plants in there have been priced. Their unit price have been based on light crude. Okay, so if you have most of these thermal plants switching over to gas, then it means that at the next review period, even if they are the same technologies, the fuel source would have changed. So the price should, under normal circumstances, be coming down. The only problem that we see is that it's also priced in cities. Okay, so assuming the prices are supposed to come down the fuel side on the technology side, and you have currency depreciation or inflation, you might not see that the price is coming down, not because the cost of the technologies have come down, but other factors probably would have pulled it up. But in the long run, you know, the gas is the cheapest uh, in, t in terms of the thermal range. Is the, of course, people will say cold, but I, I, I don't think, I don't agree with that, that debate, so I won't go in there. But the cleaner versions of the thermal plants, gas is the cheapest, especially if it's a combined cycle plant. So ultimately, if we have more of them and we start taking out the expensive thermal plants that we have in the system, like, like those that are running on light crude, even the uh, car power one, if it switches over from heavy fuel oil to gas, it's going to be cheaper than the 14 cents that they are selling it to us, or it should be cheaper than the 14 cents that they are, they are selling it to us. So yes, ultimately, the more we have gas component or the proportion of gas uh, fired plants increasing is going to have a long term effect on tariffs. Touching on the state of Ghana's energy sector, Ismail Lejikum Hene charged governments to prioritize moves to clear all energy sector debt so as to redeem the credibility of the sector. Technically, I think we are gradually getting to where we can be comfortable, okay? Uh, but so long as we still have the debt overhang, let's see how or what the energy bond if they're able to launch it. It, it. What it basically going to do is that everybody the sector owes will be paid at a goal. So, I mean, all these entities that are, some of them are on the verge of collapsing, will be in, the posi will be in a stronger financial position. Um, so once the debt overhang is dealt with, and then we, we, we do have resources to bring in the fuel that we need to run the plants, okay? When you have an installed capacity, it's not energy. It's almost like saying that you have a car sitting down there and you don't know how to drive it, or you don't have fuel in the car. The car won't take you anywhere. You still be using taxi or truck truck. So that's what it means. So we, we are in a situation where Thankfully, we do have gas. Um, Akosomo is not doing too badly. The more we need to find money to bring in crude, the sector is, will be challenged, okay? Government doesn't have the money so readily available. Meanwhile, Energy Minister Bwachi Ejako has assured of the massive reduction in electricity prices following the coming on board of the car power ship, which is expected to directly feed into the national grid for a period of 10 years. 
All right, you're watching the Business Live. We want to take you now to the British Council where uh, the former Director General of the Securities and Exchange Commission, uh, Dr. Du Ananienchi, is addressing a lecture on the financial markets. Let's uh, listen in. Section 33 provides that where the Commission consider it may be necessary to prohibit trading in securities or that a person may have contravened some of the provisions of the Act or Companies Act, the Commission may require an officer or issuer or a person contravening the law to disclose any information of which he is aware, being information that must have affected the dealing that has taken place. All right, so that uh, was from the British Council. We'll try and restore that feed for you. But uh, my colleague, Ebenezer Sabote, is on the line at that event. He joins me on the phone lines. He tell me the latest from there. So, uh, Ebenezer, essentially, what has uh, Dr. Du Ananienchi been saying? Okay, Barrow, um, good evening to our viewers. Dr. Du Ananienchi has been speaking about the security and exchange market. His lecture is under the topic the Securities Industry Act of 2016, enhancing regulation for the development of an efficient capital market. What his, his lecture is thought to do is to give an impact of what the Act 2016. You know, we all know that there were Securities and Exchange Act of 2013, which was amended in 2016, and thought to give an impact what impact that Act has brought onto the market. And let me also say that before the Federal the podium, Dr. Afedi, Eko Afedi, who is the deputy MD of the Securities and Exchange Commission, also gave an insight or highlight about some developments on the market. And he indicated that the market has grew by up some 38 percent. Also, the financial index grew by some 40 percent. And he, been, he was saying that the market has been responding to environmental, I mean, economical uh, changes in the environment, which is an indication that the market is doing well. Okay, and Eben, we are expecting them to touch on uh, various happenings within the financial sector uh, in the last couple of weeks, uh, the collapse of UT and capital banks, as well as uh, events unfolding on the stock market, the fact that some firms were suspended and all of that. Anything of that sort, uh, has anything of the sort come up? Exactly, Darrell, this is the right question because um, the man, he has also revealed to us that just today, one company has been deleted from the stock exchange. Actually, we want to push him. We know generally when he get information, we want to break it. We want to push him, but he said we should give him some time. And after the lecture, he will give us all the details. But for, uh, I mean, for the benefit of our viewers, one company has been deleted from the market today. We all knew that on Monday, five companies were deleted. And this morning, one has been recorded. We come back to the best, but we, we were just told that one other company has been delisted from the market. It also says that so far, both local and foreign investors have been responding to what is happening in our banking industry and then also shareholders on the Ghana stock exchange. So it is not only our local I mean, investors who might be looking out for what is happening, but foreign investors are also interested in what is happening on the capital market. Itself. All right. Even Sabute, we'll keep our fingers crossed for that update later on. Thanks very much indeed. We want to move on now. The National uh, Lottery Authority is to ensure lotto marketing companies and retailers, as well as winners, no more pay the taxes on their earnings from the game beginning next year. This is ultimately aimed at boosting the revenue government generates from the sector. There's more in this report. Unlike the current situation where government benefits by way of taxes from just about 15,000 licensed operators, the move is expected to rope in the over 500,000 illegal operators, popularly known as banker to banker. According to the Director General Kofi Osei Ameyao, the new strategy should also provide a lasting solution to the long standing challenge with illegal lottery, which has deprived the country of the needed revenue over the years. We have had discussions with Ministry of Finance and I think they share in our vision and uh, we are preparing uh, some sunset clause to give us a period of time within which we will try to see that by withdrawing the tax component we'll get more people uh, operating as LMCs 
and the more people stick in with us so that the more we get people if the win ratio goes in our favor we are able to recover uh, more revenue than to take those small rev taxes uh, and then when we win it is a small a pool of uh, revenue because there are not many people patronizing. Mr. Ose Ameo adds, this new regime is a win-win for all stakeholders as plants are far advanced not to only distribute more low to point of sale devices but to introduce more value-added services on them. We are going to try and bring in um, with the banks. We are also bringing uh, VAS, value-added services, to come along with uh, the lottery services because the POS system or terminals uh, has got so many channels, multifunctional, but we are only using a small one unit aspect of it. So it's not economically uh, respons responsible on our part to let a, a, a equipment that can take on mobile banking, can take on uh, payment of electricity, water, collect GRA taxes, uh, collect uh, uh, property rates, and then also it can not only be a point of sale, but point of payment okay. assistance. One can do money transfer, can pay school fees. The banks can can have it as an agency, so you can transact business with the, with your bank. You can pay bills there. You can withdraw a certain amount of money there. A whole host of uh, uh, businesses can be run on that POS system. All right, so we are moving on now to our interview of the day, and pension expert Andrew Zagbulovi has been speaking to Joy Business about the Social Security and National Insurance Trust, NIT's inability to release information on investments and earnings to the general public. According to him, the SNIT Act is not being implemented in full, hence the failure to realize the full benefit of the pension scheme. Mr. Glovi also uh, called for the National Pensions Regulatory Authority, NPRA, to bring all the pension schemes in the country under one system of operation. He spoke to Ebenezer Sabote. Interview of the day. Hmm. Studying this and reading all this about SNES, I've never come across where we say, okay, there's always a target benchmark. Year on year, you go, okay, don't go above this, don't go above. That's why I see that. So when you ask the question about, are we spending too much? What benchmark are we giving that we can, you know, hold them to the threshold? That, okay, you're supposed to have spent it, but it's gone beyond that. So you think because we don't have a benchmark, we, we have no right to question? That is some of my, my concern. You see, it's not that we don't have, we, we need to question. Therefore, as a contributor, you know, you have all the right to ask the trustees, because don't forget, they are trustees basically holding the funds in trust for what? There will be beneficiary, you see. So the beneficiary, a contributor, every time have questions. That's why I have a worry if things trying to keep some information from, you know, uh, contributors. No, let the information flow. Let all the information come online. Give us statistics. We want to see those things online. People want to uh, query things, but you don't share some of the information and keep and know what you have to come out. No, let the information flow. Mr. Mr. People make decisions. And do you think the whole operations of SNIT yeah. need some review? Its operations, I mean, itself as a SNIT. Uh, for me, the way I understand SNIT, I think that we have done that review coming forward with the I say, the new pension system that was enacted in 2008, that is the National Pension Regulation Authority. And then also, we have done another what we call uh, amendment of that uh, law that was in 2004. The amendment was done you know, to do that again. Uh -huh. So we haven't gone to the full hall of the implementation of the, the three-tier scheme. What I mean by that is that there are an aspect of those three-tier uh, pension scheme which what I mean is that the three tiers simply mean that you know you have the first year where contributions and benefits and all that are managed by SNIT as the first year, and they are supposed to pay what you call pension. And pension yet mean that they should be pay what a monthly, you know, repeat uh, periodic payment to people when they retire. But for me, is again what we call what the regulatory role coming in to go through the full hall of what I mean as unification of the pension system. 
And this unification means that other parallel schemes to SNE, such as CAP30, uh, the GU, uh, the university superannuation schemes, all these things have to come on board. We should to be integrated. Have, yeah, they should be integrated. That is what, if you look at. So we haven't fully implemented, you know, the art yet. Uh -huh. So the arts put a lot of things that must be done to SNIT. 